Hello, I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today, we'll be talking about the coverage of higher education at the Washington Post. Jenna Johnson is an education reporter at the Washington Post. She also runs the Campus Overload blog at the Post in which she tags her columns with, quote, your syllabus for navigating the high-powered campus scene. Jenna is a graduate of the University of Nebraska. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Well, pleasure to have you. If I could start with this, and I, and I hope you're not offended by this question, there's all this instability in the world, in Syria, in China. Why do so many people care about campus life? <laughs> That's, that is a good question. Um, the whole reason that, that we cover campus life the way that we do is that um, it's such an important part of so many people's lives. Whether you're a high schooler looking to go to college, you're a college student who's living that right now, you're a recent graduate who's still paying for that, um, or you're someone looking back fondly on your years in college. These are four years that are uh, very crucial in kind of building who you are. That's what schools sell themselves as during admissions tours. Uh, and a big reason that people pay for that experience is not just for everything that they're gonna learn in the classroom, but everything that they're gonna learn outside of the classroom. What they're gonna learn from people living on their freshman floor in their dorm, uh, from being in student clubs, from going on and study abroad or doing an internship. And so we wanted to make sure that in addition to writing about everything else happening in the world and everything happening in higher education, um, about uh, budget cuts and um, you know, movement at the administrative level and policies, that we weren't forgetting to kind of document what it's like to be a college student nowadays. Well, and do you think that that's different than it was than you started when you started writing? Um, I think so. I think it's I think it's always a little bit different. Um, there's some things that never change. Um, you know, freshmen and sophomores are still gaining a little bit of weight their first couple years. Binge drinking is still a problem. Um, you know, uh, students being distracted in class is still a problem. Um, but each class has kind of its own set of problems mm -hmm. too. Um, Facebook wasn't around, um, you know, it was just getting going when I was in college. Twitter wasn't around back then. Um, you know, text messaging was just getting going. And today you have students who are very, very wired um, to each other, who learn in different ways, who have laptops and iPads and access to all of this information that's out there. Um, but you also have students who are paying paying more than any generation of college students has ever paid and who are going to college already worried about if they're going to find a job or not when they get out of college. College students are much more stressed out today than they were you know, five or 10 or 15 years ago and definitely more than when their parents were in school. So it's a, um, it's, it's a, lot, of different, a lot of different things that are going on there right now. Well, do, do you think that, to that point, do you think that uh, college is worth the money? That's a good question. <laughs> and that's a question that a lot of people are asking right now. Um, it, it is. You have to have, you have, to have a college degree. Um, you know, to, to get most jobs nowadays, you need some sort of training. Um, now, how much should you pay for that? That's, that's where you get into, the, into a lot of these questions. Um, what a lot of schools say is, when this question comes up about, well, you're charging $60,000 a year um, for you know, room, board, tuition, fees, you know, health center, all, all of those things, um, you know, how, is that worth it? Is $60,000 worth it? And, and the first thing a lot of schools say is, well, no one actually pays that much. It's, it's actually less when you take out um, financial aid and um, you know, different scholarships and, and things like that. Um, so then you get a, a number that's a little bit smaller, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but not too right. much. You know, is, is that number worth it? And the schools say, 
Well, every year we're getting record numbers of students who are saying that it is worth it because they're applying and we're not able to accept them all. And so it's really, a, um, there's a demand for those degrees and you have colleges that you know, are needing to continue paying their faculty and their heating bills and you know, research dollars and things like that and tuition's just going up, up and up and up. And you know, at what point is that gonna stop? A lot of people would say it's, it's gonna keep going up, maybe not quite at the same rate that, that it has been, um, but that it's still, even at that big price tag, it's still worth it to so many people to be doing that. Well, as you know, when I'm not hosting the show, that's exactly what I'm doing, is advising students on that, uh, that transition. But I've noticed in the last couple of years, uh, more and more families are closely examining what the value is of school A versus school B. And then going forward, I mean, I think that most people would recognize that college is important, both to an individual and to the country. But the question is, which college? Uh, you went to the University of Nebraska, uh, you didn't go to Northwestern, you didn't go to the University of Wisconsin, you didn't go to the University of Colorado, you made a choice. Yes, and um, I think that's something that families weren't doing um, 10 years ago or even five years ago and that the recession has forced them to do. Um, that there are a lot of families that their college savings plan was just to tap into the equity of their home to pay the bill. And with that gone, they're having to face these hard questions, you know, that the money is more real. Um, it, you know, there's, I, I don't know many banks where an 18 year old can walk in and get a loan <laughs> to get a $100,000 loan, um, you know, to go on a huge vacation or to, to do things like this. But, but it's very, you know, for the most part, it's very easy to take on debt to pay for college. And, uh, you know, until now, people weren't really thinking, what's that debt going to look like when you graduate? Are you going to be able to pay that back? And while you're paying that back, what does that mean you're not going to be able to do? Are you not going to be saving for a home and, and for things like that? I mean, I know for me and in my household, my parents are very thrifty uh, and, you know, saved for a very long time for college. And we sat down with a whole list of schools that, that I wanted to go to. And, you know, when I started looking, Nebraska wasn't my top choice. Um, you know, I looked at a lot of private liberal arts schools that were out of state, some other out of state um, state schools where we would have been paying out of state tuition. And, you know, I had X amount of money. And, um, you know, for all of these schools, you know, Nebraska, for me, came up as one where I could afford it, <laughs> right. you know, where, where I could pay for it, but it had a really good journalism program um, that I was really, really interested in. And it turned out being a great, a great fit. You know, I mean, I think there's so many kids who get so locked into, mm -hmm. you know, my self-worth is locked up in going to this school or this school or being able to tell people that, you know, I went to this prestigious school or, or this one. Um, but a lot of the school, kids that I talked to, no matter where they went, they ended up for the most part being happy. <laughs> you know, and if they weren't, they transferred after a year or so. I think that's a fair point. Yeah. Would you mind saying a word or two about your internships? There's always a controversy about whether or not students should do internships. I usually take the position that internships are important, but some people criticize my position on that by saying, well, they're not being paid for something while they're interning. Yeah, this is a, uh, especially in a city like D.C., which is practically run by interns during the summer, this is a very touchy topic um, because, um, because of the recession, you have more and more students who want some sort of experience on their resumes. Um, I, I did four internships when I was in college, and I'm so glad that I did. I also worked at my student newspaper. Mm -hmm. That's how I got experience, you know, and if I didn't have that experience, I, I wouldn't have gotten, you know, hired on at the post um, later on. Um, but what's the cost, you know? I mean, luckily I was paid for all my internships um, and, and barely broke even. It's really expensive to, to move to a new city and find a short-term rent 
and right. pay for gas to get around and um, you know feed yourself and, and things like that um, and so you know even when interns are getting paid it's not quite covering all their expenses when they're not getting paid it's really a problem um, it, you know, students are using leftover loan money to pay for a lot of these things, um, and when that's not covering it, they're just charging it to credit cards, and um, that's a high interest rate. And um, you know, they're they're paying for for that experience, and only the kids who can afford to do that are going to do that. It's you know, making these experiences for um, kids who can afford it, not not everyone. So, internships are really important. Um, you know, employers should be paying their interns. That's not going to happen, you know. So therefore, you know, again, just like kids applying to college in record numbers, you have kids applying, applying to internships in, in record numbers, willing to work for free, and um, employers not, not wanting to say no to that. Um, the Department of Labor has come out with some um, basic guidelines for how not to abuse these students, um, that's helped a little bit. I think there's just, um, employers are a little bit more aware of what the, the laws are than they were in the past, uh, but it's definitely, I hear stories every day from interns who, it's not an educational experience, and maybe had they known that um, before they signed up for this summer, they might not have done that. Well, do you use interns at the Post? We do, we do. Um, and uh, that's how I got to the post. I, I started off as an intern, and um, it's a you know, especially in in an industry like journalism, um, you know, getting to work at a real newspaper mm -hmm. and um, you know write articles and, and things like that. More than anything, it makes sure it ensures that you actually want to do this. <laughs> you know, after my first internship, you know. I could have realized I hate this. There's no way I want to do this, and then I would have had time to change majors. Right. Well, so so then in, in retrospect, what do you think you learned the most from your second internship? If the first internship was well, I, I decided I really do want to be a journalist. What did you get from the second internship? Yeah, um, a, a confirmation of of that, and um, just more experience. Um, I, my first internship was at a um, small daily newspaper in rural Nebraska. Um, my next one was at a big newspaper in Omaha, mm -hmm. and then um, the Des Moines Register. And um, just the opportunity to work with editors and um, you know become a better reporter, become a better writer. Um, and also something that you pick up on internships is um, how to work in a newsroom, um, how to play, kind of play the the, um, the politics that, that kind of go on there, and that's something that can't be necessarily taught in a newsroom, um, you know, about how to, um, you know, seek out mentors, how to um, talk your stories onto the front page, um, you know, how to um, uh, just get along with people. Well, speaking of the front page, I mean, what do you do? Do you just kind of wait for the editors at night and say, I really, really like this story. I'd like it to be on the front page. <laughs> well, it was easier at the uh, daily, we daily rural newspaper that I worked at. Um, how it works at the Post is, um, you know, I, I, we have two higher ed reporters, uh, me and uh, a guy named Dan DeVise, and we both write for the paper regularly for all sections of the paper. We also run blogs and do Facebook and Twitter and, and things like that. Um, and not, you know, not nearly all of our stories end up on the front page. Um, you know, I mean, that's really reserved for um, stories that we find really say something different about the experience and, um, you know, are um, maybe something that we spent even more time than normal researching and writing um, or something that's just really um, of, of interest. Um, like Georgetown, Georgetown students uh, stealing the hands off the clock tower as a prank. Um, sometimes fun, interesting news is, is also what we want on the front page, just to give readers a break from, from everything else that's up there. You know, it's funny you mentioned that, because I was going to ask you about that, to, to, to kind of compare that to the controversy about the Georgetown speech the other day uh, in terms of uh, contraceptive coverage. But I thought they were both interesting pieces. 
Exactly. Well, it's a, um, you know, student life can take so many different forms. <laughs> um, and even when um, I'm writing about something um, as silly as a, as a student prank, we try to use that as an opportunity to kind of um, say something about culture and say something about the lives that Georgetown students are living and, and other students are living. Um, and with that story, it was kind of an opportunity to, um, you know, kind of take a look at, you know, when, when tradition kind of becomes a little dangerous and the fine line that administrators have to walk in loving their traditions but not necessarily wanting students to do those traditions, let alone get hurt or break things or, or things like that. Um, you know, a, a week or so after that happened, I did a story about uh, commencement and um, one of the speakers for a, an awards ceremony um, was the health secretary, Kathleen Sebelius, and her appearance on campus brought um, all these protesters, anti-abortion protesters, who were upset that she helped author the health care legislation, um, now law, that you know will perhaps mandate that contraceptions are covered. And um, you know, Georgetown especially, I've seen um, kind of become a symbol of, in the middle of all this debate. You know, you have the oldest Catholic university located in DC, and um, you know, is kind of wrestling with all of these all of these issues. You know, less than half of their students are Catholic. You know, it's a Catholic institution. Um, it's a Jesuit school. There's Jesuits living in the dorms amongst the students, um, and they have all of those values. But how do those translate into policies and laws and, and things like that? So, it is. We try to, you know, even on on things that are, you know, as boring, <laughs> you know, as healthcare policy. You know, we do kind of try to. Um, uh, you know, shed some light on kind of what that means about a university. Well, I don't think it's boring at all. I mean, I think that it's important, but I think your work is very important because what essentially you're doing for the public is helping to humanize it in some way. So yeah. uh, health policy is a little confusing. Congressman Jones and Senator Smith are discussing it, but how does it affect my daughter or my son who's a sophomore at Georgetown or George Washington or UDC or the University of Maryland how does it affect their lives? Exactly. Actually, when I started my beat a couple of years ago, I, I had this idea in my head that I was writing for college students, that I was going to write stories that parents really wouldn't be interested in, that would really speak to college students. They'd post mm -hmm. them on their Facebook walls and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and when I read the comments in my, you know, on the ends of my stories, and when I get emails from readers, sometimes it's college students, but most of the time it's parents of college students who just want to know what their kids are doing, <laughs> you know, who want to know, you know, what, you know, what's happening on college campuses or, or what they should know about or, you know, today's parents are, are very interested in, um, you know, what, what's happening to their kids and what's happening in the world and how that affects their kids. Sure. Do you think that more parents or students view your columns? It's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. Um, I think it's a lot more parents <laughs> than students, um, but even though that's true, I try to keep writing for students um, because parents want to feel like they're listening in on that conversation. Um, they don't necessarily want it written straight to them. Well, in my line of work, I always find it interesting that a lot of families, a lot of parents are really interested in reflecting on their own college experiences. And I, what I find interesting about your columns is they allow families to do that. So a lot of my students, families, will often say, Jenna's really on point here because I was thinking about this. And of course, they were thinking about that 30 years ago or 20 years ago, but you've somehow tapped into their memory. Oh, I'd love to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it is, uh, um, you know, a lot of times I'll write a story and uh, the responses that I get back aren't necessarily um, questions or, or anything like that. It's just a jumping off point for, you know, well, when I was in college, um, an example of this would be, I did a story about how most colleges have gotten rid of um, the trays in their lunchrooms um, because as like a green measure, then they, you know, less trays to wash means 
um, you know, better, better things for the earth. And so students just walk around with plates. And so I wrote this story and got all of these wonderful responses back from people, you know, about, well, in the 1960s at Dickinson College, we used to steal these red trays and go sledding. And, you know, people sending in photos of trays that they had stolen from their lunchrooms. And it, it really is neat um, that these memories, um, you know, even more so than almost any time in your life, that they're, they're just so strong for people. But in actuality, you really are covering memories. I mean, you're covering tomorrow's memories, not to sound so cliche, <laughs> but tomorrow's <laughs> memories today. Right, right. That's the goal. <laughs> but also, there's also a responsibility, on the other hand, to raise some serious issues. So even though we want to wax nostalgic about you know, going down a, 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 a you know, slope in, uh, at Dickinson College, there are some serious issues that kids are going through that a generation ago people didn't have to go through, whether it was debt or other issues. Would you mind maybe saying a word or two about some of the other issues that you think are most pressing right now besides the debt issue? Definitely. Um, it, and it is, you know, um, higher education has come a long way um, from generations ago. It, especially it used to be that, you know, college was for, for the most part, wealthy whites, um, wealthy white men. Um, and now you're seeing um, schools um, finally, you know, becoming more diverse and, and opening that access. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done, um, but, but that is, you know, a big, a big issue facing a lot of schools is how do we get the students in here who really need to be here and uh, might not have that opportunity if, if we don't give it to them. Um, and mental health issues are a huge issue on college campuses. Um, you know, part of that might be uh, students worrying about getting a job after college, but another part of it too is um, with advances in medicine, a lot of students um, with some pretty serious mental health issues in the past might not have even made it to college campuses. Um, you know, and here they are and um, they need support. And, um, you know, not a lot of counseling centers can keep up with, with all of that. And um, so one of the most pressing issues is um, just depression levels among students, um, you know, making sure that they're reaching students who um, might need help. And so I've seen a lot of training going into um, training, you know, not only RAs who live with students, but faculty members who might notice you know, this kid hasn't been in my class lately. Um, you know, this student wrote something that really scares me. Um, you know, this student um, is suddenly very, very quiet and something might, might be wrong. Um, a, a lot of these initiatives are part of um, crisis management or, um, you know, uh, risk management um, because of instances like um, the shooting at Virginia Tech um, and now the child abuse scandal at Penn State, um, schools are realizing that they are responsible for the lives on their campus and that they have to look out for those kids. And so you're seeing a lot more emphasis being put on that. Plus with parents paying so much to send their kids there, they, they want to know if there's something wrong, if their kid is you know, at risk for becoming violent or developing a drinking problem or um, you know, in an abusive relationship that they want that flagged. How do you put that in a positive way? <laughs> um, there's not, oh, how, I mean, a positive way to, to, to put it would be to look at schools who have done a really good job of changing that. Um, you know, not, not everything I write about is, um, is positive, you know. Um, but, for example, I did a story earlier this year about um, Fraternity Rush at the University of Maryland. And, you know, again, an age-old institution um, that has a lot of problems, you know, and that has a lot of traditions that shouldn't come along, you know, into the next generation. And so I took a look at the University of Maryland, um, where they've put a lot of effort into changing their rush process. Um, and trying to get as much of the alcohol out of that as possible. Um, and in hopes that 
you know, alcohol then won't be part of orientation and that hazing won't be a problem. And, and there are still problems there, it's not perfect. Um, but that was an opportunity to look at a school that admits that it has this problem and um, is putting forth some ways to change it that you know, other schools might be able to pick up. Fair enough. Well, we only have time for another uh, question or so. Okay. Um, would you mind just giving some tips about for college students in terms of students who are interested in journalism, students who are ex exploring what they want to do? You're looked up to as a, as a very well-known person in the Washington area in terms of your outreach for your columns. People read you. What personal advice would you give? Well, my, my, the big one is write for your student newspaper. Um, you have to do that. Um, even if you only do it for a semester or two, um, it's just a perfect way um, to um, learn the basics and to make some embarrassing mistakes <laughs> at a small level instead of at a big level. Um, and to, to work really hard. Um, you know, right now there's, there's all this talk about how, you know, there's, there's no future in journalism for young reporters, that there are no jobs there. Um, the thing is, this is actually a really great time for young reporters. Um, you know, especially people who are coming in who can, you know, bring some new ideas about how to not only tell stories in print, as we have for a long time, but to do things online and to be willing to experiment with finding sources on Twitter or promoting your stories on Facebook and things like that. Um, and so I, I would really encourage them to, um, you know, to, to do that. Um, and then the other thing is just to learn the basics. Um, yes, it is good to know how to shoot your own video or to be able to show that you can tweet or Facebook. Um, but you still have to know how to write <laughs> and how to spell names correctly and get details correct and, and things like that. So if you have students who are, you know, getting some experience on campus, um, learning the basics, but also learning some of this new digital stuff. Um, that's what's going to really help them. Well, I think that's helpful advice. Good. Thank you, Jenna. Oh, sure thing. Thank you. If you would like additional information about Jenna Johnson or the Washington Post, please visit WashingtonPost.com slash blogs slash campus dash overload. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at Higher Education Today at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.